So tonight I want to talk about secrets, but from a different perspective. The title for tonight's message is, shh, you're a secret. You see, it's, it's easy to laugh at the friend who you trust with the secret because, you know, they'll reveal it and then you'll deal with the fallout that comes after that. But what happens when you're the friend? Now, be honest, how many people when I made that analogy actually thought of themselves? A couple hands, all right, honest people, I see you. God bless you, you better be honest. Three, four hands. <laughs> what happens when we become that person who's revealing secrets? And specifically, what do we do when we're revealing our own secrets? So I'll say it again. Tonight's title is Shh, Your Secret. Right now at home, and I want to acknowledge my amazing wife, Tina Watkins Quay. Right now, she's at home with our five month old chubby baby. He's awesome and amazing, and every time I look at him, all I can think about are I just have so many questions. I'm like, oh my God, what are you going to look like when you get older? What are you going to say? How are you going to laugh? What is your smile going to look like with teeth? <laughs> I think one of the, the main questions I have for him is a question that I received as a child, and it's a question all of us received when we were children. Do you remember when people would ask you, what are you going to be when you grow up? And we all had fun answers. Mine was I was going to be center fielder for the New York Yankees. Clearly, that didn't work out. But it's such a fun question, and it's such an easy question to throw out there, because sometimes in people's answers, well, not sometimes, most of the time in people's answers, you learn so much about who they are in that moment. And so it becomes a question we ask pretty frequently. What are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to be when you grow up? And it wasn't really until I started to work on this message that I, I wondered how come we always ask what we're going to be when we grow up. But we very rarely, if ever, ask who we're going to be when we grow up. What usually means a profession. What are you going to do? What are you going to be known as? What is your title going to be when you grow up? Who is a completely different ball game? Who is more about the characteristics? I find it interesting that we tend to ask the easier question to answer more often than the more difficult one. And I think implicit in that is the idea that we realize when we ask someone, I mean, even right now, as grown and mature adults, if someone were to ask us, who are you going to be? in the next five to seven years, most of us would pause. It's not an easy question to answer, and it's especially not an easy question to answer for a child. You know children's minds change every 30 seconds. They have no idea at the time when you're five, seven, eight, nine years old who they're going to be. But as we get older, I think we have to make sure we are always asking not only others around us, but ourselves. Who are you going to be? And that's where we get to the title. You see, the difference between what are you going to be and who are you going to be, what are you going to be is a journey that will lead to an answer. Who you are going to be is a journey that leads to wisdom. Not every answer is wisdom. But wisdom, according to the word, is what we are supposed to be chasing after. Which makes the question who we're going to be that much more important 
and it has to be at the forefront of our minds with everything that we do, with everything that we say, with everything that we allow ourselves to be in contact with. Who are we going to be? Let's go to Romans 8, 19, because apparently we're not the only ones who are excited about who we're going to be. It says, for the earnest expectation of the creation, the creation being the universe, that which God has created, the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So not only are we focused and excited about who we're going to be, apparently the entire creation is. The universe right now is eagerly waiting for us to be revealed. But I love the way the word puts it. It says that we are to be revealed. Which means if we are to be revealed, that means we are concealed. Shh, you're a secret. This is really important for us to understand. The revealing of who we are, of who God has purposed and planned for us to be, right now is a secret. And there's a handful, and by handful I mean two. Two, two. Two forces that know who we're going to be. One we know for a fact is God who created us. He knows. I'll reveal the second force later on in the word. But we have to come to this understanding that this secret is secret for a reason. Remember earlier I was talking about how you've got that friend who can't wait to reveal the secret. Sometimes we are that person when it comes to ourselves. We get a, a little hint of what we're supposed to be, of who we're going to become, and we just let it go out to, into the entire world. And we let everybody know, and we broadcast it. And we start telling folks, and telling folks, and folks start telling folks, and all of a sudden, we can't figure out how our business is out there. Shh, you're a secret. God ultimately created us to be a secret, to be a secret that is revealed in his timing. As we are wa walking and making our way through destiny, this is super important for us to understand. We are a secret. Who God has purposed and planned for us to be is a secret to be revealed by him at a very specific time. I want to go to Psalms 139. It's a passage most of us are very, very familiar with. We start at verse 14. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows well. Go to the next verse. Love this. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. I'll pause right there. We were made in secret. The, the verse before that where it mentions being skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. When you translate that, the lowest parts of the earth is the deep. Not low in terms of priority, but the depths of the earth in terms of the deep. The mysteries of the deep. All the mysteries of the universe, of God's creation, how stars come into play. Why does the sun shine like it does? Why does water have its texture? Why does the wind blow where it does? All of those mysteries, which science does its very best to approximate an answer for, 
in that depth, in, that, in the midst of that, that's where we were created. Think about that. And nobody is around but God. So if we are focused, truly focused on figuring out who we're supposed to be, there's only one place for us to go. And yet we will find ourselves drawing inspiration for who we're supposed to be from other sources other than God. Who in this house loves promotion? Who loves a promotion? Who wouldn't mind a promotion? I don't think there's anyone who would turn down a promotion unless it was something else hidden in a promotion. But I don't know anybody who doesn't like or want a promotion, yet we need to think about what it is about a promotion that really gets us so excited. Is it the bump in pay? Sure. Maybe some extra perks, some extra vacation days, why not? Maybe it gives us a position of higher authority within a particular organization, sure. But if we really get down to the root of what it is about a promotion that gets us so excited when we receive one and keeps us hungry and motivated to work to receive one, it's the idea that we are now closer to the next thing. And in getting closer to the next thing, it gives us the feeling that we are approaching who we're supposed to be. So we look at promotion and get excited. And sometimes we get so excited, we get lost in the promotion. We start to think that the promotion is actually informing us on who God has purposed and planned for us to be when the promotion is merely just a move upward. If we're not careful, we will rest our hopes, we will rest our journey, we will rest our search for who God has created us to be in our receiving or lack of promotion. And then when we don't get a promotion, we say, well, clearly we're not who God made us to be. And all of a sudden, we're starting to sow doubt into our process, and it stops us right where we were. And instead of taking it to the creator, instead of taking it to the origin, instead of taking it to the one who was in the midst, in the deep, creating you, we instead look at the promotion. And we expect the promotion, or the lack of promotion, to inform us and give us answers. The most important thing we have to remember, beyond the fact that shh, you're a secret, is that that secret is between you and God, and you and God alone. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Keep going. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. I will stop right there. You can keep that up there. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. When God created you, there was nothing else like you. My substance being yet unformed. God saw a creation and created it based on nothing else around. Shh, you're a secret. Not only are you a secret, you are a unique and special secret all unto your own. So asking someone else or looking at someone else's life or looking at someone else's characteristics or looking at someone else's journey to gain information or insight on your shh secret will not help you. It's between you and God. We want answers. There's only one place we can go. During worship, after worship, when we talked about uh, accepting no substitutions, 
We cannot afford to accept substitutions when we need answers about who God has made us to be. We can't afford for answers to come from any other source other than the one who created us in the deep. The one who created us and created us like nothing else. If we had a carbon copy cookie cutter God, it'd be very easy to get answers because I would just look to the copies. But God in infinite wisdom said, oh, no, 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 no. If you want to really know who I made you to be and why I made you exactly the way you are, you have to come to me. And this is a good thing. We'll find out later on, this is a great thing and it is a protective thing. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. So we go back to that verse. So God creates us in this infinite, deep, sees my substance being yet unformed, so we're not formed yet. And in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me. I haven't been able to get this verse out of my head. How many times do we wake up in the morning and try to figure out what we're going to do with our day? How am I going to handle my day? Oh, my day has gone so badly. I missed the bus. I caught the bus and I sat next to someone I didn't like. I was late to work. There were no donuts in the break room. <laughs> I don't like where I work. I wish I could move on, but I can't. All of these things, we get up and we react to our day. We react to our schedule. We react to all of the things we have to do. React, react, react. Yet right here it says, and in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me. Why am I reacting to something that was made for me? Your day is fashioned for you. I'll say that again. Your day is fashioned for you, which means the 24 hours we are blessed to be allotted was tailor-made for you. Now, we think because the day is tailor-made for us that it should be great. Everything should be wonderful. It should be roses, and we should just skip through the lilies. That's not what it says in the word. It just says the day was fashioned for you. <laughs> so the things that happen that disappoint us, the things that happen that test our patience, fashioned for you, <laughs> the things that you know set you off, just have you all out of your Christ-like mind. <laughs> the second you hear it and you walk in the door, it's eight o'clock in the morning, you thought you were getting to work early and bam, the thing that sets you off is right there. Your day was fashioned for you. It wasn't for someone else. You didn't walk into someone else's day and, oh my God, what is this? This clearly is for somebody else. Let me get out of here. No. <laughs> Your day was fashioned for you. So the question we need to have when we wake up in the morning or as we're going through our day is no longer, how's my day going? No. How am I wearing my day? Your day's fashioned for you. How are you wearing your day? Not whether it's a good day or a bad day. Because God calls us to be whoever we are regardless of the day. We don't get to say, well, you know, we had a, I had a bad day, God. I just, 
I just really didn't feel like looking and sounding like you today because my boss just said some craziness to me and uh, I just couldn't handle it. So I had to just let it go, God. I had to let him have it, God. I couldn't help myself, God. Your day is fashioned for you, which means you can help it because if you couldn't help it, it wouldn't be in front of you. If you couldn't help it, you wouldn't be dealing with it because we don't serve a God that gives us more than what we can handle. Your day was fashioned for you. When as yet there were none of them, so before anyone could even count the days, they were already numbered and allotted and tailored to you. That is powerful. Which means your day literally is your day. Your day doesn't belong to your boss. Your day doesn't belong to the person who cut you off in traffic. Your day doesn't belong to your best friend who told you secrets. Your day belongs to you. And how we handle our day is completely up to us. The choice to continue to remain on the path towards who God has purposed and planned for us to be, regardless of how crazy the day is, is up to us. Keep going. Hmm, I'm trying to decide if I want to keep on this point or move forward. Ooh, this is tough. This is tough. Oh. I'm like, ooh. We're going to come back to verse 17. We're going to come back. We're going to come back. I promise. We're going to come back to verse 17. So in realizing that the day is formed for you, and not only that it is formed for you, but keep in mind where it was formed. It was formed in the deep. It was formed in secret. And isn't it interesting how the day was formed in complete secret with God and one other force, which I promise we will get to later on. But this tells us not only do we know who was there when we were created, when we were formed, when the days were fashioned for us, but we also know who wasn't. We give the enemy a lot of credit. The enemy came and stopped my day. The enemy came and made me do this. The enemy came and stopped me from moving forward. I was making progress and becoming who God purposed and planned for to be. And then all of a sudden the enemy showed up and, hold on, wait a minute. According to the word, when I was created, I was created in secret. That means that's between me and God. So if only God was there during creation and only he knows me and it's a secret, that means Satan, the enemy, doesn't know anything about who God created me to be. So how can he stop that which he does not know? Satan does not know God's plan for you. The enemy does not know God's plan for you. Sometimes we act as if he knew exactly what we were about to do and then just showed up and stopped us. No. He wasn't in the depths. He was not in the deep. He was not with God when he formed us. He was not with God when he wrote in his book, The Days That Were Fashioned. He was not there, which means he does not know unless we tell him, shh, you're a secret. One of the hardest things to do when we get a revelation of who we are, it's hard for us to just 
keep it to ourselves. It's hard. I'm not going to lie. It's hard. Because God will tell you some great stuff about yourself. And when you hear great stuff about yourself, you want to share it with the world. You want to tell everybody, I'm great. Why? Because God told me so. I'm great. I'm going to be great. I'm going to do great things. Great, 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 great. You just watch. The only issue with handling that greatness in that way is this enemy of ours, the other guy, who was not supposed to know anything at all, all of a sudden has information to act on. When the enemy comes at us, there's really only a couple of ways that he does it. We know Satan, the enemy, as the accuser, the accuser of brethren. And here's how he accuses. He takes your past and things you've done in your past, and he takes an interpretation of your present and accuses you of still being who you used to be based on an interpretation of your circumstance right now. That's the attack plan, folks. That's how he works. He will take your past and say, oh, this situation looks kind of like a couple of years ago when you used to be and when you were I wonder if you'll do it again. Maybe you will do it again. Maybe you're not a new person because here's the circumstance and it looks the same and you used to do this, so maybe you'll do it again. And that is how he works. He works on your past, reimagining of the present. I said reimagining. It doesn't even have to be factually what is happening. But all it takes is a misinterpretation of your current circumstance that allows this attack right on in. Notice I didn't say he knows anything about your future. Remember, he was not in the deep. So he cannot accuse you about who God created for you to be. All he can do is distract you from moving forward towards who God created you to be. All he can do is keep you mired in who you used to be. But he cannot actually speak to the future that you're walking in front of because he has no knowledge of that. He doesn't know you. He knows who you used to be, but he doesn't know you. He doesn't know who you're going to become. He doesn't know what you do. He was not privy to the secrets of the deep. He was not there to inform the fashioning of your day. All he can do is affect how we think about what God has already planned and told us is going to happen. That's why it's so important for us to understand the nature of this secret it's between us and God. And because we know that it is a secret, we know what the enemy does not know. It's interesting, I've watched a lot of uh, law procedurals on TV. And at some point in time, every law television show has one of these cases that comes up. It's called uh, spousal privilege. Anybody know anything about that? So sp spousal privilege is this. Hope I have this right. If you're in court, man and wife, you are not allowed, let me make sure I say this right. You cannot be made to testify against your spouse. In other words, there's communication between you and your spouse that a court cannot mandate for you to bring forward. Keep that in mind. That means there are things, vital communications between you and your wife, between man and wife, in a covenant where you cannot be made to bring that forward. Interesting how we get that right in the law. Man-made law understands that in covenant, 
there is privilege, which means you cannot speak against the person you are in covenant with. Man-made law gets it right. So how can we not understand or see the parallel in this? A covenant, the covenant between man and wife is the earthly representation of the covenant that we're supposed to have with God. And so we have a covenant with God. So the secret communications that take place between us and God are privileged. Which means for our secret, for who we are, God's not telling. If God isn't telling, and it's a secret, well, how else can the enemy find out? Us. We are the only ones who can reveal the secrets of that deep. And this is a, it's so important for us to understand because it's on us. And we can trust for a fact, God is not revealing it. Spousal privilege. We're in covenant. That means he's not going to spill the beans. And this is where it becomes so important for us to continue to manage our communication with God. Continue to receive from our communication with God and know what to say and what to project and what to let out versus what is supposed to stay shh, secret. Now, when I say secret, in terms of who we're going to become, I want to make sure we don't have any confusion. When God speaks a great thing over you, it is one thing to prepare to be that which God has purpose and plan for you to be. That's ideally what we should be doing. So there is a way to prepare to be this great and amazing thing God has told us we're going to be without having to broadcast it. It's another thing to try to shrink and hide from it and say, well, it's a secret, so I'm not going to do anything about it. That's not it. If we ever need to come to an understanding to who we are in any given moment, the best definition for who we are at any given moment is in preparation for who God has purposed and planned for us to be. That's who we should be. 24-7 in preparation for the next revelation of who God has made us to be. That's who we should be right now. So we're always in forward motion, but we're never hiding from this great thing that God has shared with us. We're still moving towards it. We're just not letting the entire world know it verbally, but we still prepare to do it. So as I mentioned in the deep, where God has fashioned the day for us, there was one other force there with him. Let's go to Proverbs 8. It says, now the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. Let me pause. Me is wisdom. So God was not completely alone when he formed you and when he fashioned the day towards you. It says, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. Next verse. I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. Skip forward to verse 30. Then I was beside him as a master craftsman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and my delight was with the sons of men. So God is in the deep, 
creating the sun, the moon, the stars, creation as we know it. And he's got one partner, wisdom. And as wisdom is watching all of this unfold in front of him, her, my delight was with the sons of men. All of the amazing things wisdom saw and the delight of wisdom was with us? Let's understand the magnitude of that. There are so many unexplainables that we call miracles that wisdom watched God breathe forth and yet the delight of wisdom was with us. Chapter eight in Proverbs is a very enthusiastic love letter from wisdom to man. And I skipped a couple of verses inside because it details all of the things that God was doing in this moment of creation and yet wisdom said, you I delight in. And so when it comes to seeking out who God has made us to be, this is why the word is so emphatic and so adamant about wisdom. Get wisdom, get wisdom. It's worth more than silver. It's worth more than rubles. It's worth more than gold. Get, get wisdom, get wisdom, get wisdom. The reason that the word is so emphatic about wisdom is not so that we can sound smart in arguments. It's because wisdom was there at the beginning. You want insight into who you are supposed to be. Get wisdom. Two sources for our identity, for our purpose here on this earth. God and wisdom. They were there when you were made. They were there when it happened. So there's no reason to seek anyone or anything else. Get wisdom. There was no one there but God and wisdom. And so our quest needs to be to go after wisdom. We're very fond of using a phrase, learn by experience. It, 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 it's a phrase I used to use pretty often until I thought about it. Learn by experience. So you mean if something happens to me enough times, Eventually, I will learn from it. There's a small, small problem with that. The only way that we learn from an experience is not from allowing the experience to just happen over and over again and stand there like some victim of circumstance. We don't learn anything from that. It's when we look at, a, at an experience and we search for the wisdom. Where's the wisdom in this? This has happened to me before. I've been in this circumstance before. I've been in this scenario before. I've had this conversation before. I've had this interaction before. Where's the wisdom? Where's the wisdom? I'm in my dating life and I date this person and after X amount of months, we break up. And then I find another person, same amount of months, we break up. I find another person, same amount of months, we break up. I find another person, same amount of months plus one day, we break up. <laughs> and all we can say is, well, I guess I'll just, I'll learn from experience. I just keep trying, just keep calling them in. When we are not diligent about seeking the wisdom in everything that we do, when we're not diligent about that, we are wasting time. We are wasting time. And we are pulling ourselves further and further and further from the destiny God has for us because that experience is going to keep happening over and over and over. We will face it or a slightly different remix of it until we get it. And it is wisdom. Jesus. 
so we look at this and now we understand why God is so adamant about chasing after wisdom. Why God is so adamant about having us read his word and be in his word to meditate on it day and night because there is always wisdom. There's always wisdom in his word. There's always wisdom in his word. I'm, off, I'm so fond of saying, read the word until you find yourself in it. And if you haven't, keep reading. I guarantee you will find yourself in the word. Read until you find yourself in it. Without fail, at some point you will read the word and find exactly who you are in your season, in your circumstance, right then and there. I love reading Proverbs because Proverbs will let me know when I'm being wise and Proverbs will let me know when I'm being foolish. I welcome them. I need to know these things because I can't always assume I'm being foolish 24-7. I can't always assume I'm being wise 24-7, not within my own understanding. I can't do that. Because if it's up to me, I'll just say I'm wise all day long, 24-7. I got this. Nobody wants to honestly admit, man, I am being a fool, not without some help. And that's what Proverbs will do. You'll read a passage, ooh. Oh, that is me. That is me. That is me. Go forth, lazy sluggard. Oh. <laughs> no, he, won't, he will put his hand to the bowl, but won't pull it out to eat. Oh. And you read and you say, whoo, that's me right now. I, I need to do something about this. That's wisdom. That experience is what getting wisdom is all about. And the getting wisdom allows us to get that much closer to who God created us to be. So not only look after and look for and hunger for nothing less than the full authentic experience and presence of God, but wisdom. I want to go back to Psalms 139. This is the verse I wasn't sure if I wanted to go into at that moment. We're going to come back to it now. A verse 17. Now, the beautiful thing about wisdom is wisdom, the un wisdom is, I hmm, hope I can say this right. Pure wisdom coming from heaven the, are the unfiltered thoughts of God. When it comes, when it's, and you know it, you know it when you feel it, when you hear it. Because when you receive it, everything you're looking at in that moment completely changes. So it is very important for us to understand that gaining that wisdom is having access to the thoughts of God. So we come to this verse. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Next verse. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. The first few times I read this, I was a little confused. Go back to 17 again. We speak about the precious thoughts of God, how great is the sum of them because there are so many. Moving forward to 18. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. So we're again talking about the vast, the vastness of the amount of thoughts and wisdom that is God. Dreaming with God is easy because we have all of the fun and all the things that he shows us that we want to see. But when you wake up and the reality doesn't match the dream, are you still with him? One of the hardest parts about receiving 
wisdom and gaining insight on who we are purposed and planned to be is that inevitably there's what God has told us about who we're going to be and then there's who we are right now and there's the gulf that exists between us right now and that amazing person God has told us we're going to be. And what happens in the midst of that gulf is the most critical part of our journey. Because in the midst of that gulf, it becomes very tempting to just spread the news. Because you get so tired of keeping it to yourself. It gets to a point where we almost feel as if we have to speak it. If I talk about it enough, if I say it enough, if I could just tell some people about this amazing thing that God has shown me, then I will be that much closer to it. When the truth of the matter is, the revealing of the sons of man is happening on God's timing. So speaking to people about it, especially if you have not been led by the Spirit to speak to them. Speaking, when we speak out of impatience, doesn't actually bring us closer to that which we have been shown. It makes it harder for us to get there. Because now, instead of focusing on the goal, instead of focusing on moving forward, now we're doing a tennis match deal. I focus on that, then I focus on me, then I look at that, then I look at me, then I look at that, and then I look at me. And in going back and forth, we just make ourselves dizzy. And now we can't actually move forward towards who God has told us we're going to be. One of the hardest things to reconcile is that moment when you wake up from a great God vision and your reality says it hasn't happened yet. And so it's important for us to understand that having the vision, as long as our eye is on it, as long as our eye is on the vision of who God has told us we're going to be, we will move towards it. Wherever you train your eyes, that's what you're going to walk towards. But if we keep having our eyes out and then in and then out and then in, it's confusing. The body says, like, how, can, how am I supposed to move? I don't know where you want me to go. We have to understand that the wisdom that we receive, whether in daydreams, regular dreams, our privileged communication with God has a specific timing for when details are supposed to be revealed. I want to look at Genesis chapter 37. Here's an example of what happens when we start leaking the details a little too early. People started giggling. Y'all know this story, huh? So we come to this part of the word about a man named Joseph. Joseph has a really awesome coat that is given to him by his father who loves him very, very much. He said, now Joseph had a dream. And he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Now, his brothers, as you read early on, his brothers didn't like him to begin with. They were already mad at him, just for being who he was. Somebody, somebody identified with that. <laughs> somebody felt that in the spirit, OK? And so he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. Oh, Joseph. <laughs> Let's move to the next verse. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. <laughs> Somebody knows the rest of this. <laughs> And his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Let's pause right there. 
dream sharing. <laughs> Got to be real careful with who you share your dreams with. As we can see by this verse, some of the, the people that much closer to you, the closest people to you, not meaning to, will hurt you that much more because they've received privileged information. What happens when we broadcast what God has spoken to us, the great things that God has spoken to us, when we broadcast it outside of his timing, is we create obstacles for ourselves. All of a sudden, people who are not supposed to know what they know, well, now they know. And they feel some kind of way about it. And now, out of that feeling, you have opposition. And this is opposition that was not supposed to be there. This is opposition that wouldn't be there had you just not said anything at all. Remember, shh. You are a secret. And this is what happens when the secret gets out. And it's not supposed to get out at this time. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. So they hated him for everything. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers. Now hold up. The first time he had a dream, clearly it did not go over so well. Young Joseph decides to do what? Share another one. This is what I was talking about earlier in terms of, I'm just going to learn by experience. Same scenario, same setup. Didn't learn what he was supposed to learn from the first time. I don't know about y'all, but if I share some really big news with somebody and they kind of go, I'm not sharing any more news with them. I'm good. Thank you. You know what? I've got to go. I'm, I'm fine. There's no way I'm going to bring another set of good news to them. But apparently that's what he felt. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I've dreamed another dream. This time, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So, bigger stakes, bigger dream, bigger vision, greater vision. Let's see what happens. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down the, bow down the earth before you? Now, his father loved him. He was his father's favorite. Even the one who loved him the most has a rebuke for him for this vision that God gave him. Because this happened outside of God's timing. I'll get very briefly into what happens afterward. Joseph finds himself in a pit, he finds himself a slave, he finds himself in prison. Now eventually everything God told him would come to pass, it came to pass. It happened, but it happened with a whole lot of opposition that didn't need to be there. All he had to do was keep the privileged information that he had with God between him and God, but he broke privilege. And now he has forces against him that should be for him. It's one thing to have enemies become bigger enemies, but when family becomes enemies, when the people who outright love you the most are rebuking you, something I have said should not have been said. Joseph finds himself at some point further away from the people he's supposed to be supporting and be loved by than he's ever been in his life because he spoke 
out of turn. What we have to, have to, have to remember is yes, the universe is eagerly awaiting the revealing of the sons of man, but that doesn't mean it's our job to do the revealing. God is going to meet their anticipation in his timing. And it's going to be glorious and amazing when he does it. But we have to get out of his way and let him do it. And in order for us to do that, we have to make sure we don't break privilege. We have to keep what he has spoken to us between us and him. It's hard to be a secret especially a good one. When God has told you a grand thing about your life, ooh, it is hard not to run, jump, shout, and tell everybody you know and everybody you don't know. But that's not in his timing. And the most important thing is his timing. It's not so bad to be a secret as long as it is a secret between you and God. Because you know that when he reveals it, there won't be opposition in this way. It'll be in his timing and it will be an amazing thing. That last point, this last verse, I'm sorry, the verse before this. And yes, can we go back to Psalms 139? I believe it was verse 18. If I want to leave everybody with one important point, when I awake, I am still with you. This is for my dreamers. For everyone who has a dream, who receives the visions and the wisdom, who's receiving from God in their dreams. For everybody who has a dream, hold on to your dream, protect your dream, love your dream, note your dreams, write them down. But the most important part of your dreams, when I awake, I am still with you. Make sure when you wake up from your dreams and you go forth to making the dreams a reality, that you are doing it with the one who gave you the dream in the first place. Everybody's best friend right now is rejoicing because everybody here just learned how to keep a secret. Your best friend's gonna like you a whole lot when you go home tonight. Everyone stand. I won't, I won't pretend that receiving a grand vision from God is easy. It is not. I won't pretend that it's any easier to act out or to walk out to make your way toward what God has shown you. It is not. But what I will say is that it's worth it. Whatever grand vision God has given you, not only is it worth it to move towards it, you are worth it. Remember, the day was created for you, fashioned for you, fashioned uniquely for God's vision of who you are, of what you're going to do. And so I don't want anyone to leave this place tonight thinking that their dream is so big and the vision is so vast. Who God has called you to be is so great 
that there is not a clear path towards it because I promise you there is. I just want to call some people down to this altar. First group of people I want to call. If you know you received a glimpse, a peak, or maybe a full-on 4K resolution viewing of who God has spoken to you to be, if you've seen this, if you've heard this, if you've searched out his wisdom and what you found just blew your mind but blew your mind in such a way that you felt like you couldn't move towards it or that you weren't enough for it. I need you to come down here right now. We're going to break that lie off tonight. Good secret keepers. Next group of people I want to call down. If for any reason at all, the enemy has sown in a lie, the lie that you are still who you used to be, and that you can't make progress and move towards who God has called you to be. If you know you keep receiving reminders of your past and you can't understand why that is, reminders of the previous version of who you are, and those reminders are keeping you from moving forward, and those reminders are telling you that your past is still who you are. If that's you, please come down because we need to break that lie as well. Oh yes, oh yeah, come on down, come on down. communication if you have not yet established that relationship with God if you haven't taken the foot forward to say God me and you let's have this privileged communication let's establish this covenant if you have not yet established that relationship with God yet come on down and let's start tonight. Let tonight be the night that you start this powerful covenant where you chase after him and you chase after wisdom and you receive all of what he has for you. If you haven't taken that step to establish that covenant with him, come on down. Come on down. I'll wait. live stream audience, you can come on down from where you are too. We got you. Father God, thank you tonight. Thank you for 
for this moment right now where we have agreed to expand our search for knowledge, our search for wisdom, our search for you. And thank you, Father God, for expanding our understanding of the secret place. Thank you, Father God, for reassuring us that the secrets of the deep, the secrets of who we are, of who you've created us to be, of who you've purposed and planned for us to be, Lord God, thank you for reassuring us that those secrets are safe with you. pray, Father God, that you anoint the lips of everyone here. Anoint the lips of those who are receiving this word through live stream or podcast. Anoint all of our lips, Father God, with your timing for when to speak, for what to say. And for who to say it to. Father, this night we receive the protection of our dreams that could only come from you. We receive the protection of our identity that can only come from you. And we receive, Father God, the strength to do whatever you tell us to do, whatever you have purposed and planned for us to do, Lord God that we may lay hold and lay claim of the identity that is ours right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we put behind us that which is behind us. Father, we put behind us who is behind us. Father, we lift our eyes towards who you have spoken we are going to be. We fix our eyes on that version of who we are. We fix our feet to walk towards that version of who we are. We fix our mind, Lord God, on your thoughts, on your wisdom, on your insight. And we fix our hearts to receive only the authentic, uncut, raw version of who you are and an experience and encounter with you at all times. We accept no substitutes. Father, tonight we came hungry. Hungry for wisdom. Because now we know the true value of wisdom. Wisdom is insight into the secrets of the deep, and wisdom is insight into us. So, Father God, rain your wisdom down in this place. Let our hearts be prepared to receive and to continue to receive and to be hungry to receive more. Thank you for anointing us this night, Father God, with the Spirit to search out your wisdom in all life experiences. Father God, we will no longer live just to live from this night forward, from this moment forward. We will live to learn. And in learning, we will be. And we will be based on the learning on just the living. And we rebuke every lie spoken into our ears, spoken into our spirit, that says that your vision, that this day is not fashioned for us. We rebuke that lie in the name of Jesus. receive the anointing that comes with the knowledge that the day is indeed fashioned for each and every one of us. And we know, Lord God, that every work you begin, you complete. Every good work you have begun, you completed. 
So the good work that starts tonight, we walk forward knowing that it is done and it is complete.